Welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday evening. I am. I have a, we have a very special show. Uh, all shows are special, but sometimes there's shows I just look forward to more than others. And today is one where I'm really looking forward to because we have a, a beautiful young lady all the way from Italy who's been here for many years, but she has a wonderful story to tell. And she's part of our Sunday conversation about you see all the glory, but now really hear my story. Part two. The Sherrard Show is brought to you by iHeartRadio, ladies and gentlemen. If you ever miss one of the Sherrard Show episodes on television, you can all, always pull it up on your podcast. Just go to iHeartRadio.com and you can pull up the Sherrard Show. And then also is brought to you by Essence Television. Essence Television Network is the new network for the tele for the Sherrard Show. It launched this past Monday. I'm so excited. You now can be able to watch the Sherrard Show um, in the comfort of your own home. All the f favorite episodes you can watch from the Manhattans to Smokey Robinson to Stevie Wonder, so on and so forth, including this episode with the lovely Aurora Ross lady. Uh, just go to EssenceTelevision.com. All right, ladies, um, this particular young lady is a painter. She's not only a painter, she's a photographer. She's also an artist and an influencer. And she has a wonderful story to tell because her story didn't begin in America. It began on the streets of Italy. Welcome to the show, Aurora. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So glad to have you here. Now, let's jump right into it, Aurora. Now, tell us, when did you first make it to the American shores? I came uh, now 17 years ago. Um, I was born and raised in Italy. My, I have a formal education, so a formal background, completely different from what I'm doing now. I have a PhD in uh, archaeology, history research. And, you know, I met someone and I decided to come here and start a family. So my life completely changed, like from top to, bo to bottom. It was completely like a revolution. Uh, yeah, it was hard. It was hard at the beginning. <laughs> now, the thing that um, is interesting is that a lot of people have a dream of wanting to come to America when they're a child. Some of them fantasize about coming to Hollywood, being in movies and films. Was that your dream when you came here? No, not at all. You know, the United States was the last country I would have ever came because, you know, I'm more into history and archaeology. So, you know, this country is way too new for me. And that was my beginning struggle because when I came, I thought, oh my God, I wasted my entire life because, you know, I got my PhD at 29 and I arrived here like a couple of months after and thinking, what am I going to do here? Because either I work as a teacher, which was not an option, or I work in a museum, which is even worse. I can't travel anymore because now I have two little children. I can't use my education. So it, it, was, it, it was a change. And you know, the life here was completely different. And, but you know, it all worked out. It all worked out and like it went on organically, like I say. And you know, in the end it's not that bad. Of course, you know, I miss home and I miss my life before, but you know, I adjusted, kind of, I adjusted. You said you got your PhD at 29 years old. That is incredibly impressive in archaeology. For those who don't know archaeology, archaeology is the study of rocks and being able to study the history of how old certain things are. Uh, rocks, bones, things like that, correct? Yes, I'm specialized in uh, history research in Christian and Palo Christian art. So anything like, I don't know, before moving here, I found out I was expecting my daughter. I was in the Sahara Desert working at a Colosseum in the, in the desert. So that what that was my job. That was my passion, what I love to do. And, you know, and after I was like, if I have children, I cannot do this life anymore. You love working in the desert. Is that what you said? I love the desert. <laughs> yeah. now, now, what were some of the temperatures in the desert that you were working under? Oh, my goodness. Uh, some it can go from 120, 125 wow. to really low temperatures at night. And that's why, you know, I suffered the cold. Mm -hmm. To me here, I'm good when the temperature is between 90 
99, I'm good. Oh now, my goodness. <laughs> if you go anything below 71, I'm already like with blanket and I'm cold. I, I, I cannot deal with the cold. But wow. I like the heat. And, and 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 I know a lot of people don't find beauty in the desert. They just find it as a place where a lot of people suffer because there's no water, there's nothing but sand, temperatures go really high to one extreme, very high in the day, very cold at night. But what is the beauty in the desert that you see? You know, it's very peaceful and it's, how do I explain? To see that sand and those mountains, the dunes and the quiet in the sand. And you know, you might think it's crazy, but the more you are covered in the desert, the less you suffer the heat. So you might see the people like laying on the desert with blankets on, all wrapped up, and you think, okay, what is wrong with you? It's hot in here. But <laughs> in, on the other side, you know, they are isolating themselves from the heat. So it was kind of smart. Yeah, a lot of the military people who've uh, gone into Iraq and Afghanistan have said the same thing, that, you know, they had to learn from the natives that the more you cover yourself, that resists you and you're cooler with those garments that opposed to having yes. less on. Yes. In fact, I, when I was uh, in the desert, we went also to visit the Star Wars set, which, you know, it called me crazy. I did not know at the time what Star Wars was. I mean, they were <laughs> showing me. <laughs> they, sh they were showing me the place. And I was like, yeah, OK, this is cool, but why am I here? But it's fun to watch because you can see the natives, they uh, have their houses underground. There is literally holes in the desert and you look down and there is houses or, you know, like you see in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Remember that you look down and there is the village underneath? That's exactly how it was because, you know, underground it's cooler than what it might be on top. It is really hot. It is hot. Wow, wow, wow. What, what a thing what is that, um, amazing about this young lady is that um, not only is she um, come all the way from Italy, to uh, come to Hollywood, but your work is also in some of the Hollywood museums. And also we're gonna talk about her influence, uh, Hugh, how Hugh Hefner has influenced her as well. Um, when we come back from this quick commercial break, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna talk more about her and her career. And then we're also gonna talk about how many languages she speaks, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sherard, the wonderful, the wonderful Aurora uh, Rosalita is on the Sherard Show. We'll be right back right after this. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard, having a wonderful conversation, our Sunday conversation with the lovely Aurora Rossellini, all the way from Sicily, Italy. She came here when she was 12 years old. But many people have dreamed of meeting Hugh, uh, the late Hugh Hefner. But not only has she met him, but he was very influential in her career. Tell us a little bit about that, Aurora. I met F, we call him Uncle Hef, me and, you know, myself and the kids. Because, you know, I had to disguise it a little bit with my children because they were a little young. And um, I did my first art show in Hollywood at the, it was at the Havalon in Hollywood. And he came as a guest and he came, you know, with the girlfriends and all the entourage. And he was looking at my work and he said, you know, you would you like to paint me? And they say, yeah, of course. I mean, it's fine. So he invited me to the Playboy Mansion, which, you know, at the time, again, coming from Italy, I'm not sure who is this person or what is he talking about. And I told him, I say, well, you know, I don't go anywhere without my children. And he said, well, you can bring them. So, you know, later on, people were asking me, like, you really took your children at the Playboy Mansion. What is wrong <laughs> with you? But, you know, in, you know, looking back, it wasn't anything that bad and you know we went there and they did uh, it was funny because I he asked me you know to be drawn and I did the drawing and he looked at it you know the famous um, picture of when he's younger with the rope and the you know while he's smoking and then you look at it and he signed it for me and they give it back to me so I still today have that piece and you know later on we he kept inviting me, he kept calling me, and it, it was a nice relationship because I 
you know, many people see him under a different light that probably I got to know him. I see more, I saw more of his personal life. He told me a lot about his life, his beginnings and how he made it where he was, what he was really doing, you know, with those girls that they mentioned because he really was trying to have the girls there, not for what people thought, but to try to keep them away to set from certain situations. And, you know, I learned a lot because we were talking about philosophy. We were talking about art and photography and he was telling me nice story about Marilyn. And so I had a lot, a lot of insights from him. Now, how did you meet him, Aurora? It was uh, during my heart show. It was at the heart show that he came and he was visiting and it was an event pretty much. And when he asked me to go, I say, yeah, okay, I'm coming. And, and after, you know, there was all the Halloween parties and, and we were, you know, really close up until I think one year prior to his death. And, you know, I remember when, you know, the secretary passed and then the brother passed. And after his brother passed, I thought, oh, you know, he's not gonna have that long anymore because that was his life. He was, you know what they say, when people really close to you, they pass, then you know, it's your, uh, also it's your time that you feel like it's your time to go. Correct, correct. Wow, that's pretty That's pretty amazing, Um, your relationship and how you met and things of that sort. Now behind you, is that some of your artwork? Uh, yes. Looks mighty, mighty impressive. The th three things I see on here. I love that bedroom. It's really nice. We're going to talk yes, about that in a moment. But also, um, you were speaking about another one of your mentors as uh, Dolce Gabbana. Is that correct? Yes, Stefano Gabbana. He was, you know, I met him in Italy. I really knew uh, Domenico because he's from Sicily. And he's, uh, he used to sew, uh, his father used to make suits for my father because my father is a politician, was a politician. So we used to hang out a lot and then he moved to Milan and they started, you know, the Dolce & Gabbana brand. They started, you know, the relationship and that's how I got to know him much better. And, you know, we had a friendship. We still are in contact today. You know, sometimes he send me drawings or clothes, which is what my daughter loves, of course. And yes, he's another one that we were really, really close. Wow. Um, now, you are a photographer, ladies and gentlemen. She's also a photographer. She's not just an artist. She's also a photographer. Now, you got your inspiration from being a photographer when you were back in Italy. Is that correct? Yes. OK, so when, um, when I began in Italy, you know, in Italy, we have a different way of doing school, right? Because we have to choose our own career path out of middle school. We don't wait till college. So when you are out of middle school, they ask you the classic question, what you wanna do? Well, at the time I had no clue because I went, I started school at three and a half years old because I was too advanced. So coming out of middle school, I'm still a child. Uh, so my teacher decided to send me into art school. From art school, you know, the normal, you know, the normal things to do was to go into Art Academy. In Art Academy was where I did photography. I did it for two years and after it took other two years with an European uh, master. And, you know, it, it's a different culture in Italy. So being an artist, especially for a woman, was not acceptable because if you tell people, oh, I'm an artist, they say, oh, you are a loser or, oh, you know, what are you doing with your life? It, it, especially in Sicily, it was not acceptable. People think artists are crazy. I mean, at least back then. So, you know, I had that same notions thinking, okay, I gotta do something with my life because I gotta make a living. It wasn't a choice to be home. So that's how I decided after to go into cultural assets and archaeology. But I think, you know, life is funny because it kind of rerouted me. And what am I doing now? I'm back working with my master pretty much and not even my complete education, but only two years. So that's why sometimes they say I wasted 
like overall for my life in an education that I'm only using two years of it pretty much. Now, Aurora, um, in the culture now today in Sicily, is it still the same where the women are looked upon as just being reared to be a wife and nothing more than that, or are they allowed to have careers now? Uh, it's, it's okay to have a career, but it gotta be a career uh, acceptable by society. You know, the most common thing is you got to be a mother, you got to be home because, you know, the mother is the really uh, who brings ahead the family, right? Um, you know, being an artist is still a little like, eh, you're an artist, really? Are you making money? Are you a loser? Are you crazy? Are, <laughs> you know, are you on drugs? It's Those really, are the classic questions. They, they really go that far to say, are you on drugs, even when you're an artist? Oh, oh. yeah. Well, look, my mom, because I had two options, either go to the Heart Institute or go to the Heart Lyceum. And she said, oh, you're not going to the Heart Institute. You go to the Heart Lyceum because it's more classical and you can study architecture. So you're not going to be a complete loser. And I was like, thanks. OK, that's fine. <laughs> So now, um, when you moved here, um, when you were 12 years old, I know it, it, Italian is a common language. Um, a lot of people have moved here speaking various languages where they found it very difficult to speak with uh, people in the community. But there's a lot, a lot of Italian in California. Now, did you know how to speak English when you moved here? Yes, I did. I study uh, because, you know, for us, it's mandatory in Italy study a second language in school since you are a kid. So I study English in elementary school, and then I study French in middle school, and Spanish in high school, and then, you know, Latin in university, which after gave me all the, you know, the background, how to pick up all the other languages like Portuguese or like whole Italian language. And plus I'm Sicilian. In Sicilian slang, we have a lot of um, mixed words. Like, you know, we have uh, the Sicilian is like a completely different language. is a mix of Italian, French, Spanish, and English too. So, so it was really easy to pick it up. So how many languages you speak? I'm counting six. How many you count you speak? I think so. I, I There might be a little in between, a little like the vulgar Italian or, you know, the, those type of languages, but yeah, pretty much is Italian, English, Spanish, French, um, Latin, and okay, Sicilian. So, so first, Italian. In a, first say it in Italian. Say, Sherrard, you're the best television host in the world, in Italian. In Italian? Yes, ma'am. Sherrard, say il migliore hoste del, del mondo. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds good. I didn't understand it, but it certainly sounds good. I appreciate that. Now, how about if you say it in Portuguese? In Portuguese, yes. um, to as uh, le meilleur uh, de lo mundo. Wow. You know, I had a, I had, um, a, a, a celebrity um, get a keyboardist on the show yesterday. He was uh, Portuguese and Brazilian. And um, mm -hmm. now he was Brazilian and Jewish. I'm sorry, but he spoke uh, Portuguese. So it's just beautiful to hear the language. It's a difficult language to learn um, for people who don't know, haven't studied Latin, but you speak it so well. And I love the, uh, I love the Italian language. I want to ask you a question kind of off of um, the subject and topic, but which came first? Is Italian language older than Spanish or Spanish is older than Italian? No, it's Italian because Italian began after the Roman. Uh, so it's... It, basically, they are all Latin languages, but you know, the Italian is what came first. And really, if I really have to say it, Sicilian is the really, the real original Italian language. What, now, what's the difference with, with the Sicilian and a regular Italian language? It is uh, basically in the in history, like, you know, Sicilian, like I say, is a mixed up um uh, language is like a mix of cultures because you know Sicily is the first place where all the different domination landed but really a uh, Sicilian uh, what Sicily was considered Italy at first Sicily was where Italy was born pretty much hey, wow, and wow. even the economics started in Sicily in fact at first it was called the land of the two Sicily 
Italy until you know was united and now you know it's considered like the bottom of Italy because you know history of course. Well I've always heard that you haven't had spaghetti until you had it in, in Sicily and you haven't exactly. drank wine until you've had it in Sicily. Am I, is that correct? Yes. Yeah you are correct. Oh, wow. The wine from Etna is mm -hmm. the best. Wow and then another thing that I hear is that eating is like an event because everything stops. You know, here in America, we eat while we drive in, then we eat on a run. But when it's lunchtime in Italy, everything stops and it can yes. go on for two hours. Is that correct? Okay, what you do, so this was something hard for me to adjust here because uh, in Italy, everything stops for lunchtime. You close stores, you close office, you just go to grocery store, pick up your children from school, go home, cook, and after you eat, you take a nap. Oh my goodness, that is a beautiful life. <laughs> and then you go back to work at four o'clock until eight o'clock. But from one to four or one to three thirty, everything stops because you gotta eat mm -hmm. and you gotta take a nap. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but this is the wonderful Aurora Rosalina. Yeah, we have so many questions for you right now. People are asking um, right now. One, um, this is from this is from Maybelline. She is from Iowa. She said, You're, you, you have such a beautiful look. Your eyes are so pretty. Thank and you. she said, what is some of the advice you would give someone who is from another country who's looking to come here? What's one of the biggest challenges you had to face coming to America? Oh, my gosh. Um, first is the culture, is a big culture adjustment. So you need to be ready to put your culture behind. I don't mean your heritage because you know your heritage will always be with you, but you really need to try and adjust with the, with the people here, adjust to the lifestyle, you know, do not be set with, with your own way of doing things because otherwise you will never, never adjust. And you need to speak the language. Thank it's you, all good. We appreciate the question, Maybelline. Now, now, are you still adjusting Aurora some, um, some 15 years later, since you know 12, 15, or, or are you um, basically have made that adjustment? Uh, you know, my friends always say that I did not adjust to the country, the country adjusts to me. So basically, <laughs> You know, they say, well, you know, when they do something, they say, well, she's Italian, you know, whatever. It, it's still hard, you know, certain things are still hard, but I think I adjusted pretty well, kind of. You know, the amazing thing is that, um, it's funny, um, when you, to me, you're speaking with a very heavy accent, um, but it's a beautiful accent. But yes. to your friends, they probably pick up an American accent, is that correct? Yes, my daughter told me I'm losing my accent. She's really upset. <laughs> because you say, mom, you're losing your accent. I say, see, I don't have an accent anymore. I'm American now. No. Wow. That is amazing because it's just, a, it's, it's a very thick, beautiful accent. But you. um, uh, your daughter hears something else that I don't hear, but it's, it's wonderful. But she has a trained ear in terms of that. Now, you also are an influencer. Um, and so that's something you do as well. Tell everybody what an influencer does and how did you get started? So <laughs> is... Uh... I work with Instagram as a content uh, creator and I'm under contract with Cosmopolitan magazine now and I just got verified this year. So, you know, this year was my best year. I mean, I'm sorry, it was a bad year with COVID, but really has been my best year for work. Congratulations. Yes, because, you know, I think I was able to stay home and focus more on my, my work without any distractions. So I could just get everything into it. And basically I create contents, I brands send me products, I try them out. And if I like them, I post about it, I talk about it. And you know, my, follow, my followers can look at it and it's like a promotional uh, outlet. And, you know, I never thought I would be in that position because, you know, at the beginning I was just, you know, taking pictures and posting them on Instagram. And then I had a brand reaching out and they say, hey, can we send you some products? And, you know, if you like them, you take a picture, you post it and we pay you. And, you know, I was like, 
what are you talking about? Is this a scam? I mean, <laughs> you want to give me something and pay me to get something? So no, at least I was a little bit like, okay, you must be crazy. But you know, I'm one of those people, I think I like to uh, learn more about things. And if I gotta do something, I research first, I take like a little time to research. And after, you know, I, I go full on it and I start researching it and I start learning about, you know, content creations and marketing and how to engage, you know, with my audience. And I went for it and now basically is my full-time job. I'm, I'm making a difference now with my work because here I'm working more with marketing and in Italy I'm working more with fine art photography. Now, now, so you're, you're doing your photography and you're doing the product endorsement as well. Um, now, do you shoot pictures with for models and actors and things like that or you just shoot scenes and things like that? I, I just, uh, at this point, uh, I just put aside the whole portrait business because that's what I was doing before. And now I'm just, you know, doing my own pictures. So, because, you know, I also am under contract with Getty and uh, Sachi and Sachi. So I have to own my own contents. So I'd rather do it all myself. So I take my own pictures. I take, you know, my own self portrait. I take the photography for um, product photography and marketing. So I do it all, you know, sometimes it's overwhelming because I have brands that they are like in China or, you know, in England or Canada and I gotta adjust to the times. So I do the photography during the day, but you know, at the other night I had a, a show to do with Kokorocha in China over Zoom and it was nighttime and I was like, oh my gosh. But you know, that's how it is. But what I love is that I can now adjust my own work. So let's say, you know, this has allowed me also to be able to spend time with my children, which, you know, they are teenagers. So I'm on top of it. So I can say, okay, I work today all day and I work all night, but for the rest of the week, if I have something going on and I want to do something with my kids or my friends, I can do it. And beautiful. you can still make a living. Yes. That is, that is wonderful. And you, you're speaking a wonderful story that's very encouraging to people. Um, people don't know this, but um, 30,000 people a month move from their respective places all around the world just to be in California for the movies, the films, to be a movie star. But 30,000 moved back out many times because it just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. But you came from another country, did not really know the language or the culture as well as someone who was born here and you fought and fought and look at you now. This is yeah. a lady that you you see all the glory, the beautiful home, the two skateboards in the background, the pictures <laughs> and all that wonderful stuff. But she has come a long way and here she is now doing wonderful. And she can probably travel if it wasn't for the COVID-19, she can go back and forth to Italy anytime she wants. But my thing to yeah. you, and my question is, give me two things, pieces of advice which you would give someone who um, would like to be where you are. You know, I think the way I do it, right? I set myself goals and I set a goal and I work for it. I constantly work and research and work, work, work till I reach it. And you know, do not get distracted, do not get discouraged because you know, any setback is not really a setback. Is just telling you this is not the path that you got, got to follow to reach that point. So just try again or try something different. You know, I had many brands that, you know, at the beginning they were reaching out and they say, oh, no, you know, you can do just the post for free. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. So I thought, okay, the relationship is over. And then, you know, they reach out back and now they are my biggest clients. So it doesn't mean because you receive a no today is going to be a no tomorrow. You know, you just keep going. If you, you got to believe it, you got to believe that you reach it because if you think, oh, I'm not going to make it or, oh no, this is not going to work. 
you're not going to make it. But if you keep trying and trying and go on and really believe in it, you are going to achieve. That's, you know, what I always try to tell people when they say, oh, how did you do it? You just got to believe in what, what you want to achieve. If you believe it, there is nothing you cannot do it. I mean, I started from zero, literally from zero, because I came here, I couldn't use my education. I, could, I didn't have my family helping me with my children. I, I had nothing, no one, but you know, I decided I wanted to do something. And slowly, little by little, you know, I had money. My parents were sending me money sometimes for, you know, gift like Christmas or, you know, for myself and the children. So, you know, I started buying first the camera and then the background. So, you know, I built over time. If you are in a hurry, you're not gonna make it. But, you know, just work towards it. And, you know, everything is gonna come back to you when you need it. That's some beautiful advice, ladies and gentlemen, some beautiful advice. Oh, Roy, do you have so many people? Um, this is Charles from Chicago. Charles has a question. He said, uh, Roy, where can we keep up with you? And um, are you planning on putting your life in a book? Oh, gosh. You know, I've been asked this question so many times. And, you know, I might just because, you know, I hear people always be interested in my life. And, you know, I don't I don't think my life is that interesting, maybe because, you know, I feel like we all have an interesting life. But I do believe that, you know, some inspiration, it would be good for people because I, I fully believe you don't have to let your circumstances dictate who you are or you are going to be. Okay, you okay. can change your life any day. You can do whatever you want any day. You can restart any day. I'm now 46 years old and I'm doing, you know, something that girls are 20, they would love to do, but I'm way ahead of them. And they only did this in four years. Very good. Very good. Okay. Now, um, you're, are you on Facebook? I'm on Facebook. Yes. And where can uh, they uh, reach out to you on Facebook? Uh, I, either it is my private account, which is Aurora Rosselli, or my business account is Ecclesi Creazioni. Okay, and that's one that'll be appearing on your screen, ladies and gentlemen. And then you're also on Instagram as well? Yes, Instagram again with Eclisse Creazioni. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, no weirdos, okay? Just reach out to her, say hello, I'm proud of you, and keep it <laughs> moving. There's no weirdos for that. Now, uh, Roy, we want to thank you again for being um, a guest on the Sherrard Show. We know that you're doing really big things. We thank you for this Sunday conversation. Um, where can people be able to pick up some of your art? If they say, you know, um, we would love to pick up some of your paintings or purchase some of your paintings, where could they do that? Is either on Sachi, Sachi Heart, or my photography is on Getty. Getty, um, Getty Images. That's where you can get my my heart work and my photography work. Beautiful. Beautiful. Them. I, I might have to have ask you to paint a picture of me. Yes. <laughs> I think I would love that. I think that'd be quite beautiful. Well, Aurora, thank you so much for stopping by the Sherrard Show. You can always see this um, episode as well on Essence Television. Just go to your Roku and add the channel Essence Television. That is E S S E N S E. Uh, television, and then also you can see us on iHeartRadio. This is a fascinating young lady, very inspirational. We hope she will come back again on the Sherrard Show. And on tomorrow's episode of the Sherrard Show, we have the lovely Frida Payne, the legendary iconic singer Frida Payne will be stopping by the Sherrard Show. And then Tuesday, Mr. Funny Man himself, Mr. Michael Collier is going to be on the show. I'm Sherrard. You have a wonderful week. Aurora made my week. See you next time. Bye-bye now. <laughs>